Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Deus Ex. We're back here talking to these guys because I found out something. How are the drinks here? Great, if you like right piss. Never tried it. You look like a smart guy. You want to make some money? Yes? I need to hire a thief. What do you want stolen? The baker at number 15 keeps dime. Hundred percent pure. In one of the ovens. I already busted into that place. Same deal. 50 credits each vial. It turns out that if you turn him down... I don't deal in Zyme. A dirty business. I understand. Slavery. Addiction's another form of slavery. Yes, of course. Your hands will not get dirty. 65 credits, okay? The most I can offer. You can bargain with the man. Let's see if he can go any higher. I don't like your business. Period. Guy, we have a problem. Fine, no deal. Go away. I don't like your tone of voice. Bruno said, enough. <laughs> I guess 65 is the limit then. Ah oh, well. This is a non-canon run anyway. See you later there, bartender. And now back to the main run. And also, back into the bar. There's a couple things down here that I did not quite see, which are worth seeing. First, let's talk to this guy again. Change your mind? You have a thousand credits to learn the location of the most advanced weapons. Okay. His apartment is down the street, building 11. Wait a minute. I was just there. I'm not paying you for something I already know. Good one. But I wasn't born yesterday. I'm telling the truth. Forget it. We will never do business again. I bet you think you're pretty smart. Fine. I believe you. Now go. It's nice of the game to prevent you from wasting a thousand credits like that. And this here is the other thing, of course. Luckily, 25 damage is easy enough to bypass. And we're getting in here, we get a hundred credits. And the storeroom code. Alright. Well, that's that. I believe I'm done with Champs Elysees now, and. Let's hit it! And unlike the other hubs, we're only here the once, unfortunately. I had not wanted to see this place again. Why not? I was afraid it would be like this. The same. Not a stone out of place. You would rather that Majestic 12 had burned it down? I would rather... Uh, no, let's go. Only in novels do places crumble to dust for no reason when their spirit is lost. Your mother? Lead the way. I no longer have a key. We must find my mother's secret computer room, where she did all her work. A place she kept hidden, even from me. Nice place. A good place to start would be my mom's bedroom, upstairs. My mother and I were no longer speaking at the time of her death. I left home because she and her Illuminati cronies were always pushing me into things. I was a rotten student, but that didn't stop them from getting me enrolled at La Sorbonne. I was a stand-in for the world they never got to take over. Some conspiracy, huh? They couldn't even control little Nicolette. This place sure is quiet. Right to the very end, my mother believed they were going to stitch the group back together and rule the world. Pitiful, if you think about it. Like a senile old lady filling her house with the unopened boxes from mail-order sweepstakes. But my mother was remarkable in her own way. I overheard her tell Everett one night that she had calculated Majestic 12's private key. Right here, where I grew up, she was tracking a global conspiracy and trying to do something about it. 
She had a secret computer room, some kind of monitoring station. I heard her talk about it, but I never found the entrance. Even when we were on bad terms, I continued to deliver money to Silhouette because I knew how important they were to my mother's plans. I also wanted to help Chad. A group like Silhouette has a lot to gain from an alliance with the Illuminati in the short term. In the long term, well, if my mother had been successful, we would be trying to stop the Illuminati right now instead of Majestic 12. Where now? Man, she has a lot to say. I suppose the obvious thing would be to check the front door. But of course it's locked. Doesn't seem like it would be that hard to break in, but... You know, I'm down five lockpicks. Might as well save up because there's... You know, no reason to pick open a door, I think, on this entire map. Crazy. I lost my virginity out here. I believe Mom was out conspiring to get me into La Sorbonne at the time. Now what is this area in the back here, I wonder? Mom hated this maze. Ah, yes. Dull place to grow up, huh? She still has more to say. It's crazy. I'm so glad I moved to the city. You lead. Ah, fair enough. Well, I got all three of them. Man, this door is sure is tall. Weird. I'm pulling up the floor plan. An old summer home built during the Third Republic. It's been vacant since Miss Duclair's assassination. Hopefully these elegant rooms contain some clues about the Duclair family's involvement with the Illuminati. Mom and Everett used to sit out here sipping martinis and plotting to take over the world. That's how we all got in this mess. This whole map is about as quiet and slow as it is right now. I like it. It's a nice change of pace. Sort of a quiet, uh, open house, if you will. My mom had that couch flown in from Portugal. Exactly the same as what she could have bought at La Samaritaine, except that it was once graced by the bottoms of a royal family. Well, I certainly have seen that couch around before. Amazing how clean this place is. I wonder how long ago Claire was killed. Doesn't seem like it could have been that long ago. I wonder where all the servants went. The maid did all of the cooking, but Mom always picked out the wine. She was the only one with a key to the cellar. And yeah, you can pick or blow open that door too. And since that is where the goal is... Funny, you know when I was a little girl, I used to play in the dumb waiter that goes up to mom's room. Amazing, I didn't break my neck. You can actually speed run this map pretty easily. But yes, that was a clue on what to do next. Claire's room is obviously locked, but this is a way to get in without needing a key. More lockpicks or an explosive. All three will do, and there is a key to Claire's door. Just like Nicolette's, which I just picked up. I'll wait for Nicolette to get here before I start opening anything. I could have sworn, though, that there was a key to Claire's room in my mom's room. And look, her favorite painting. I can't believe the assassins didn't take it. Oh, the hours she would spend just sitting at that table and staring up at her priceless treasure. Yeah, this is another map with a lot of secrets that you need to find. Well, kind of need. But the way they get around that is that, you know, Claire, or sorry, Nicolette, you know, explains what all is uh, noteworthy. 
sort of hands you clues so that you can find stuff like this. Key to the basement and a password and login. And hey, 1784. I looked up that date, but I couldn't find anything interesting. I believe it was 1789. Yeah, I still have the key for this. I could have sworn there was one around here. But I guess I could have taken the dumbwaiter back down, even if that door was closed. Well, anyway, 1789, I believe, was the date that the French Revolution began with, with the storming of the Bastille. I think my mother kept a room key behind a little vase up here. Yeah, sure enough. There's Beth's bedroom key. A lot of mirrors in this bathroom. A lot of empty space, too. Odd. What are you looking for? None of your business. Another of Nicolette's bedroom keys. This must be the room. I know she's got something to say in here. My little prison for 18 years. There it goes. the third again. I wanted to be in the city, but I guess Mom thought it was easier to keep her activities secret in the country. Fair enough. Plus, it is a very nice skull again. It is a very nice area, if mostly empty space. Anything down here? No. Another area down here somewhere. I could go into the basement right now. I, I know I'm missing something. It's gotta be around here somewhere. To... Wait, I don't think I went through this door yet. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. This is what I was missing. I don't know if this will help, but I used to use that computer whenever I was at home. The last time was just before my mother was killed. The login is Nicolette. The password is Chad. All right, then. All right. Chad's gone to hide into the catacombs and... Beth has responded that she's doing the best she can, but she's being followed. So, well, I guess she wasn't killed that recently. You will find no one to help you here. Beth Duclair has been dissected and placed in cryonic storage. Well, what's the point in that? Oh, hey. Another key. Another Beth's bedroom key. And another multi-tool. Not like I need those, though. Man, when was the last time I even used a multi-tool? It's crazy. Apparently I found the front door key at some point, but... That doesn't matter. We won't be using it. Instead, it's time to head down into the basement. Where'd Nicolette go? Okay. In France, the gentry keep their wine in a small cellar to preserve the flavor from heat and sunlight. I guess Tracer Tong is pitching in with the guided tour as well. <laughs> this place sure is quiet. Okay, so this is another secret door that you need to find, which I suppose is why they made it so painfully obvious. I mean, come on. It's no wonder Beth wouldn't even let anybody down here if that's the best she could do for secret doors. 
but then she didn't build it. An old bunker built during World War II by the previous owner to hide Jewish families. The Duclairs acquired the property after the Nazis sent him to a camp in Germany. Strange, I'm picking up heavy duty fiber optic activity down here. What's this? A dungeon? Well, you see, it's a place to hide Jews during World War II and. Ah, oh, never mind. The audience, at least, has heard Tracer Tongue. <gasps> now, it looks like the staircase there is blocked, so. I'm gonna try this sort of alternate way upstairs. Let's see where this takes us. I'm, I'm almost full up on lockpicks again all of a sudden. Yeah, and this is how you get upstairs. Some kind of giant routing station. Not on any telecom map I've ever seen. Petabytes of transmission. Huh? Beth Duclair's probably used it to analyze net traffic. Huh? And another lockpick. Fun. I didn't even need that bioelectric cell. Anyhow. Turns out all these rafters, you can just bust them apart with a sword. Can't run through them like you can with furniture, though. Stop moving around! And I'm full up on lockpicks again. And hey! Bonus security terminal. If you can hack it, it'll let you turn off a camera and open that storage container. So I didn't even need the password for that. Oh my god. This place sure is quiet. Let's see what we got here. Actually, hang on. I want to see what kind of augmentation this is. Ah, cranial type. Now, speaking of which, now the spy drone is actually useful. You'll see it, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities to test that out on the next map. I had no idea. You'll understand once we get there. I don't even know why I'm picking these things up. Certainly I had no idea. I, I know you got no idea now. Okay. So what were the passwords here? B declare. And... Nico Angel. Now the email here actually explains the special option I just looked at. There's a tear sheet chip with 20 unrepeatable codes to send meeting coordinates to Morgan Everett. So you found Beth's computer. We are destined to meet, perhaps. If you are truly our ally, you will help me access the MG2. Death vaccine. Find Nicolette. You will need her key in order to exit through the crypt. I will be directing you to a nearby cathedral. I haven't even met the guy, and already he's demanding we do stuff for him. Nice guy. What is it? A transmission from Morgan Everett. He wants me to go out the back way through the crypt to a nearby cathedral. The Cathedral of the Knights Templar? He didn't say. I'm supposed to access the Majestic 12 computer network. Yes, Majestic 12 controls the place now. They kill the knights for their gold reserves. Everett must want you to sneak to that part of town through the sewers that connect to our property. I thought the Templars vanished centuries ago. They invented the modern banking system and were its directors, under one name or another, until Majestic 12 took over. He said you had a key. Yes, here it is. The crypt is in the maze behind the chateau. Listen to Everett. He is right to want to avenge the Templars. The Templars inherited the gold of the original French treasury, which was run by a Templar until the order was suppressed. Just before the crackdown in 1307, the gold was secretly moved to a cathedral, where it has remained ever since. 
The Nazis plundered a third of it during World War II, but most of the gold remains. Let's keep moving. I'll go with you as far as the maze. MJ-12 could be loading the gold onto a plane right now. MJ-12 could be loading the gold onto a plane right now. You know, Nicolette's the only person to talk to on this entire map, but she sure makes up for that fact, doesn't she? Man. So you're coming as far as the maze, right? Okay, come on then. Exit the Duclair Estate through the crypt at the end of the maze. The system I need you to access is inside a cathedral that belonged to the Knights Templar until MJ-12 slaughtered the Knights for the gold reserves. I'm going to stay to go through some of my mother's things. Good luck. Everett will be a powerful ally, but you can be certain that he will have his own agenda. I'm going to stay to go through some of my mother's things. By the way, if you were wondering why there is a maze here, oh, come on. Look out, JC. I'm picking up heat signatures in the sewers. I think somebody's expecting you. Yeah. There are enemies on this map, although not too many. But as I was saying, the idea behind making a maze that leads to your family crypt is that, you know, there are valuables you bury with the dead, and you don't want grave robbers to come in here and desecrate the corpses of your ancestors. So they put mazes around the edges. Although this certainly doesn't look like a crypt. Try to ignore the smell. This sewer connects to a street near the cathedral, not too far from here. Now I'm going to end things before the map transition, and I'll tell you why next time. But as for now, do you remember who got name dropped in that last video? That's right. We're heading back to Philosophy Corner, and this time we're going to tackle Voltaire and the Age of Enlightenment. I told you we'd be back here soon enough. The Age of Enlightenment. The Enlightenment took place roughly throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. I've talked around this period fairly often because it's ultimately the source of a lot of the major conspiracies of the Western world. It makes sense if you go by Stanton Dow's definitions. If every government is simply a conspiracy gone legitimate, then when people begin to question the status quo, and start revolting, it's no wonder that a bunch of illegitimate conspiracies would start to crop up. When the Protestant Reformation took off and whole nations began to question the nature of God and religion, it led quite understandably to philosophers who began to question the nature of the universe, the role of government, and the nature of humanity itself. Remember, all these questions were answered by Thomas Aquinas and the Catholic Church, and having rejected those answers, new ones had to be found. This explosion of philosophy was also helped by that global trade network the Europeans had firmly established by this point. Christians were being exposed to the ideas held by Native Americans, indigenous Africans, Indians, Chinese, and especially Arabs, who thanks to the Crusades had already significantly influenced medieval European philosophy. Of course, they didn't have to look outwards for everything. The printing press mass-produced Bibles translated into the native languages of Europe, allowing a lot of people to read it themselves for the very first time. This close reading of the original document produced a lot of different interpretations in a lot of different readers. You might say that Baptists were postmodern critics before postmodernism. Now, the distinction between the Protestant Reformation and the Age of Enlightenment is that the latter was far more secular. The Enlightenment established the concepts of atheism and agnosticism, and it de-emphasized religion to the point that many of the major thinkers were deists, which means they believe that there is a god, but not that any one religion is the correct path to understanding him, or her, or it, whatever. This is what inspired Freemasonry's great architect of the universe and it's why their rights borrow liberally from non-Christian religions. 
This is also why Enlightenment philosophers came up with that giant eye in the pyramid to represent God. It's not Jesus, or Allah, or Yahweh, or Brahman, but rather it's all of them, and all the rest, or at the very least, it represents whomever you think is looking out for you. And apparently for some people, that's the Illuminati. The heart of the Enlightenment is generally considered the first French Republic, and to a lesser extent, the first French Empire under Napoleon Bonaparte. You're most likely familiar with the Reign of Terror. Basically, after centuries spent under an oppressive aristocracy, the people of France got a little crazy with the guillotine. A lot of innocent people died, along with the guilty. But it is understandable, at least, considering all the pent-up rage and political wars taking place. Still, that period only lasted the first couple years out of the twelve the Republic existed. For the rest of that time, France became the best place to try out all the new ideas everyone had spent the last century devising. For instance, in the early days of the Republic, several Frenchmen established the Cult of Reason, an atheistic religion which worshipped the personifications of freedom and liberty rather than any real divinity. Unfortunately, the main festivals were a little too pagan for most people, so Robespierre himself set up the Cult of the Supreme Being, which was deist, and not quite so anti-Christian as the Cult of Reason. Still, both cults essentially died when Robespierre lost his head, and Napoleon would end up banning both of them, essentially saying that Catholicism is fine, so long as the Pope isn't dictating matters of state. Revolutionary France also introduced the metric system, based on universal constants. The exact figures have been adjusted slightly since the 18th century, but the original meter was one ten millionth of the distance between the equator and the North Pole through Paris. A liter was equal to a 10 centimeter cube, and a kilogram was equal to the weight of a liter of water at zero degrees Celsius. And of course, Celsius is based on the freezing and boiling points of water at sea level. The thing is, there was also metric time, too. 100 seconds in a minute, 100 minutes in an hour, 10 hours in a day, 10 days in a week, 3 weeks in a month, and 12 months in a year, with a bonus 5 or 6 holidays at the end. Of course, while metric measurements have certainly caught on, metric time didn't, because the duodecimal clock and the Gregorian calendar were already pretty much universal, at least in Europe and nobody wanted to switch out all their clocks whenever they left the country. Voltaire Voltaire, whose real name was François-Marie Aurey, lived and died before the French Revolution began, but only just barely. He died in 1778, around a decade before the shit really hit the fan. As such, he was a firmly established voice of the Enlightenment. And as you might guess from the fact that he needed a nom de plume, he was also a very popular author, who was very unpopular with the French government. Voltaire's positions were fairly typical for an anti-establishment 18th century liberal. He particularly hated all three Abrahamic religions, and although he had some respect for the Hindu Vedas, he was really more of a humanist, which is the idea that we should set religion and dogma aside and focus on the physical world. One of Voltaire's short stories is called Plato's Dream, and in it the Demiurgos, a godly title which Plato originally coined, first creates a bunch of lesser gods, and then demands that they craft worlds for him. The one named Demogorgon creates Earth, and while at first he is pleased with his creation, it soon becomes clear that Earth is imperfect. The other gods laugh at him for that, but then Demogorgon gets the last laugh, because after all, it was Demiurgos who created beings capable of imperfections, revealing that he himself is imperfect. Voltaire had a few other ideas typical of the age, like advocating the separation of church and state, freedom of expression, and being both anti-slavery and pro-racism. However, his most well-known work by far is Candide. One of Voltaire's contemporaries, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, 
came up with a philosophy called optimism. God is great, God is love, and God is all-powerful, so therefore this world he gave us is the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire presents a protagonist who believes in all that, Candide himself, and then he proceeds to tear the poor guy's life to shreds. He basically lives through everything it is possible to live through, including conscription, an earthquake, an inquisition brought on by the earthquake, a duel getting captured by cannibal Native Americans, and then a trip back to Europe and then the Ottoman Empire. Along the way, he meets all sorts of miserable people, like a whore and a monk with syphilis, a selfish sailor who loots the city after that earthquake. And most of all, there's Cunegonde, the love of Candide's life, who gets captured and sold into sex slavery a disturbing number of times. At the end, Candide finally catches up with Cunegonde in Constantinople after she's become old, scarred, and ugly after all her mistreatment. He marries her anyway, and settles down on a small farm to make a self-sufficient living, along with what's left of his friends. All of Candide's suffering hasn't made him a pessimist, exactly. It's more that he's given up thinking of the future entirely. The final words of the novel are, Let us cultivate our garden, which is said to deflect someone who tells him that this is still the best of all possible worlds. Personal Thoughts Ever since the first human tribe fought another... No. Ever since the first boy was bullied by his... No. Ever since the first mother told her child what not to do, the human race has hosted a question. Which is better, freedom or safety? Freedom is essentially power because power is the freedom to make a decision and to see that decision carried out. To have power over others means that you have the freedom to make decisions for them, and this exchange, this trust, can benefit both sides. For instance, when I go to a restaurant, I must trust the staff to make me the food I ask for and to make it well. By doing so, I no longer have to make the food myself although I do have to pay the restaurant more money than I likely would have for the raw ingredients. On the other hand, safety has a couple different aspects. First is the safety of expertise. To go back to the restaurant, let's say that I don't know how to cook. This means that if I cooked myself, I would have to eat disgusting meals and regularly suffer from food poisoning. By trusting the restaurant chefs, I guarantee that I won't have to suffer from eating bad food, and if they can't deliver on that guarantee, then I can find a new restaurant. The concept extends to just about every profession. You trust the weather forecasters to predict the weather. You trust shoemakers to make good shoes, and yes, you trust politicians to make good laws. The second aspect of safety is protection from the decisions of others. I have the capability, most of us do, to pick up a heavy stone and crush somebody's skull with it. Now, I would never do this, not to anyone, but there are some who would. And perhaps the only thing stopping them is the fear of getting caught and punished. And some do so anyhow, but they are stopped by others before they can get away with it. Safety means that you don't have to be a victim of others or of your own bad decisions. The social contract theory was first coined by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, another of Voltaire's contemporaries, though the theory itself had been kicking around for millennia. The idea is that an entire community agrees to give up certain freedoms in exchange for protection from others using those freedoms against them. The contract is broken when the government is unable to protect its citizens, or else when it takes advantage of its own freedoms to oppress its citizens, and at that point the citizens must reform the government. Preferably it's peaceful, but often it's not. But to get back to the original question, freedom versus safety, I personally think it's pointless to ask. Freedom means having an impact on the world, it means knowing that your actions carry consequences, both good and bad, 
It means that you have control over your own life and maybe the lives of others. Safety means that you are protected from the actions of others. It means that you can trust others to take care of you, that you don't have to worry about everything. It means that you are part of a collective that can do far greater things than you could possibly do alone. The amount of freedom and safety that is best varies from person to person. It depends on how you grew up, what you want, what you expect, but to argue about which one is better is pointless. All of us need both. We are social animals who are trapped inside our own heads, and the world we have built reflects both these facts. Thanks for joining me again in Philosophy Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.